Walking down the paths at the foot of Pikes Peak, you feel exposed, scrutinized, vulnerable. Pulling your hoodie over your face, you duck your head on your way into the Anselm Society Digital Pub. But once inside, you find, amid the raucous conversation about arts and faith, that this conversation makes you feel better, you guess, maybe? At any rate, in the corner, at the table by the fire, are three people who are also having a conversation about arts and faith. One of those people is me, your co-host, Matt Melma. Hello, and welcome to Believe to See, a podcast of the Anselm Society Arts Guild. The Anselm Society is a coalition of churches throughout the Front Range of Colorado dedicated to one simple goal, a renaissance of the Christian imagination. And we do this through a number of different ways. Uh, There's our annual Imagination Redeemed Conference each spring. We have classes, we have concerts, we have all sorts of content, including two other podcasts which you can check out at our website, anselmsociety.org. And while you're checking out content, why don't you also, I don't know, rate and review this show on iTunes. Helps increase the uh, visibility of the show, all sorts of other good stuff. And while you're doing good things for us, since you're already there, why don't walking down the paths at the foot of Pike's Peak, you feel exposed, scrutinized, vulnerable. Pulling your hoodie over your face, You duck your head on your way into the Anselm Society Digital Pub. But once inside, you find, to your surprise, that amid the raucous conversation about faith and art, this conversation makes you feel better? Maybe? You hope? At any rate, in the corner, at the table by the fire, are three people who are also talking about arts and faith. One of those is me, your co-host, Matt Melema. Hello, and welcome to Believe to See, a podcast of the St. Anselm Society Arts Guild. St. Anselm Society is a coalition of churches all along the Front Range of Colorado, dedicated to one simple goal, and that's the renaissance of the Christian imagination. Now, we help do this through a variety of methods. This includes a, an annual conference called Imagination Redeemed here in Colorado Springs each spring. Uh, we also have uh, different programs, concerts, events all throughout the year. If you want to check those out, you should visit our website, anselmsociety.org. Something else you can find there is uh, Believe to See, as well as two other podcasts. Check both of those out. And while you're checking things out, why don't you hop on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts and eh, rate and review the show? I think it's a good idea. Why not? You're already doing stuff. And while you're doing stuff, why don't you get on the, the patron page and maybe consider donating to us or the other podcast? I mean, I don't know. You're already doing stuff, so it's the big deal. Whatever. Anyway, let's turn away from me and toward the other people at our table today. So one of the people at our table is friend of the show slash wife of the host, Danielle Melema. How are you, sweetie? I'm doing good. How are you? Well, I'm doing good in a sort of go behind the curtain here. Me and Danielle are recording on our phone. We tried recording on our separate phones. That didn't work. So we are currently sharing earbuds and a microphone like we're two middle schoolers in love. <laughs> I, I feel so very, romantic. I feel very romantic right now. Oh, and our, our and I feel guest, awkward. <laughs> our other guest is not sharing headphones with us, but we're still happy to have him. It's like Christopher Orr. How are you doing? Thanks, guys. I'm good. All good right. To be here. Good to have you over at the table, and before we get going, we have a lot of very interesting stuff to talk about, so let's start with something I think is interesting. Danielle, on a previous show, you had me rant about different Harry Potter theories. Yes, I was present (laughs) for that. Well, now I have a Narnia theory. Can I share it with you? Oh my, be careful. Here's my theory. (laughs) Every resident of Narnia is a vegetarian. Because animals talk, is that? Yeah, so picture you're like at work in Narnia. You work at like Yeah, that would be awkward, wouldn't it? They have offices in Narnia? Yeah, they do now. The middle managers. And you work with a cow, (laughs) and the cow walks up and sees you eating a burger. You're like, it's okay. It's not a talking cow, so it's cool. Mm. Then you come to work the next day, and your tiger, who's like your boss, is like, oh, no, it's a human taco, but it's not a talking human, so it's cool. That's a good thought. Would you eat cow if you worked with a talking cow Mm, not in front of the talking cow 
Okay. Chris, I'll throw this over to you. Would you be a vegetarian if you lived in Narnia? Wow. Gosh. <laughs> I think I would have to really get into some sweet kale and spinach and carrots. I think I'd have mm. to kiss the steak goodbye. Maybe there aren't talking cows in Narnia. I don't, I don't know. remember them it in seemed... the book. Well, there's a scene I, I in the silver there, chair. There was the stag. Yeah, exactly. There, I think there's a scene in the silver chair. I was pondering this on Twitter, and someone pointed out this to me. Uh, <laughs> there's a scene in the silver chair when there's the children are scandalized because, like, the giants ate a talking stag. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I just but wouldn't feel right. Stag you, and it, hamburger. I don't know. I mean, I guess we are in Colorado, and so people do, like, go hunting. They get their own venison and elk. They make their own burgers with it. So, you know what? It could happen. I could see burgers in Narnia. Doesn't have to be a cow. I'm a vegetarian in Narnia. I'm, I'm sorry. I, I just so. can't. I couldn't yeah. look my cow coworker in the face. <laughs> um, so let's transition ever so slightly now, because this is a very natural segue, to talk about... Our guest today, Christopher. So this is your first time on the podcast, but you have it been is. a member artist of Anselm for a while. So yeah. why don't you tell everyone a little bit about your work? And we will sort of kick off onto the topic for today. Yeah, wonderful. Well, um, the work that I am, I celebrate with a lot of the member artists in the Anselm with, I would describe as narrative cubism. And uh, what that is, is kind of in the tradition of the Cubist, Duchamp, Picasso, Brock, mm -hmm. of breaking what they are looking at down in their imagination and then reassembling it creatively. And uh, there's always some kind of uh, narrative behind that, but I'm kind of pressing a little bit more of a story into my work, especially in these paintings that I hope we can, can get to talk to tonight. So, yeah, there's that. And then uh, to I have a. a wonderful family. Um, and so unfortunately I'm not in a place in my painting career yet where I can just do that. So I have a wonderful time during the days, uh, working at Waterbrook and Multnomah as a book cover designer. Wow. That's great. Yeah. It's a sweet gig. Yeah, and you have also been a, for a while now, leader of the arts and faith group over at IAC. Yeah, my wife Sherry and I head that up with uh, two other members of uh, IAC's, uh, Barb Overgaard and Larry Klaus, and the, the four of us are uh, doing our best to kind of facilitate creative conversations and help artists find our, our way in the church and in the world. Yeah, absolutely. So you can see why you and Anselm would get along together so well. So tell me about narrative cubism. I love the term. Yes. So yeah. let me tell you this. I stumbled across a term that I want to use for my fiction going forward. Oh, I wonderful. stumbled over it to recording a podcast with Evangeline the other day. Okay. The term okay. is chivalric nerd. <laughs> <laughs> so I like any it. publishers out there, I, I found my niche. So, cubism, <laughs> is this your term? Is this another term? And what brought you into that? I have Googled it, and I think I'm kind of a sucker for, like, big words. My, <laughs> my loving father is a psychologist, and I think from a young age, I heard very big words around the dinner table, and I thought, this, this is cool. This is manly to use <laughs> big words. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and, uh... Over my journey of, as an artist, I can look back at times like in art school where we learned different drawing techniques where you would kind of pick two points in space on a two-dimensional surface, right? You're, let's say you're in a figure drawing class and mm -hmm. the head is at one place and the arm is kind of contorted behind the head and you have to get those at the right angle, right? So you would draw kind of a straight line between the two shapes. And mm -hmm. what suddenly appeared in the negative space was really interesting to me. And then uh, later mm -hmm. in my journey, I got to apprentice under Thomas Blackshear, and he also had me draw faces. I, I was with him for 12 weeks, and that's basically all we did. And um, what we would do is we would draw it geometrically, and so you would kind of look at an image of a face that had high contrast out of a magazine or something, and 
you would split it into the shapes, right, that are naturally there, and then we would draw it more organically, right? So some shapes always stay hard, and then you can kind of play with that. But what naturally kind of occurred for me was this love of shapes, and it helped me understand and not get overwhelmed with all of the details and and everything. So that's kind of where the, the cubistic side of things came from. And the, the narrative, I love story. And uh, I think this is another reason why I just so jive with Anselm Society and our community there is the celebration of narrative, the celebration of story. Everything is kind of rooted in some larger source outside of us that is beautiful and majestic and kind of wooing us. And I don't know what else to call that except story or narrative. I found it really interesting um, because uh, you were commissioned to do sort of the the centerpiece painting for the Imagination Redeemed Conference, uh, not this past year, but the year before. Yeah, and 2018, right. So That's what right. I loved, because you described the painting itself, you could tell us about the painting itself, and listeners, you could probably Google it if you want to. And also, I thought it was <laughs> do. you described the original concept you had that was like this big, complicated thing. So tell us about that, too, because I thought it was interesting. <laughs> All right. So uh, do you want to hear about, let, let's talk about the final painting, and then I can give the background, kind of how it, it eroded great. into what it was supposed to be and, and the fun journey there. So the final painting was called Western Wind, and um, it was, you know, often, I think, is the case, we get our inspiration from several different sources. And for me, there was this song called uh, Light Up the Sky by a Thousand Foot Crutch. And uh, it's heavy, intense rhythms. It's like spoken word. It, they're Christians, and they're just they're intense in the song. And it was the right vibe. It was the right tenor for what I was looking for in the painting. Because it was drawing a line in the sand. It was saying, no more can the church be silent. We have the light of life dwelling within us. Like when all the apostles were huddled together in the upper room and terrified, and then God fell on them, the Holy Spirit fell, and it lit them up. And suddenly it's like the roof blew off of that building. <laughs> and these guys are like unrecognizable compared to what they just were. And that was a fragment in my imagination. I feel like my imagination went there for just a moment. I wish I could live there. I wish I could have experienced that with those guys. But that's the heart behind the painting. And so you see the woman leaping from the darkness into the light. And in her left hand, she's carrying this giant flame. She's bearing light out of darkness into the light. She is coming out of the shadows. And uh, a Western wind is traditionally brings good, brings peace, brings refreshment. It brings hope. And that's what what we have to offer. And of course, through the salvation of the world, through bringing Christ to, to his rightful place in people's hearts. So the original concept was this multifaceted. It's funny. I didn't know you were going to ask me about this. I would have prepared better. So <laughs> there are some I like files to that should, I like to should remain in sketchbooks. On their toes time. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks a lot. So the original concept was going to be this multifaceted, like the 12 apostles on the bottom, kind of like holding up pillars. And then above them in this kind of swirl was like all these saints from times of old, you know, kind of spiraling up. And you saw Mother Teresa kind of up towards the top and Martin Luther King Jr. And, and it was all spiraling up until this one place where there was like this awkward hand or something holding the flame at the very top. And it just, you know, the mechanics of the piece were wrong. The narrative was really confusing and kind of convoluted. And it was going to be a mess. And so <laughs> as, as it was just being drawn and processed and then encountering that Thousand Foot Crutch song, it, it, the concept got refined and cleaned up and it became kind of what I think it was supposed to be. Okay, great. So just so you know, as somebody with three children and crushing student loans, I am unable to do this. But if I were like a Medici back in like Renaissance Italy with a fortune yeah. to spend, I would have commissioned you to paint this yes. on like a whole a whole fresco of a wall. Oh, yeah. wow. Yeah. All right. So just, just so you know, just so you know, it would have been there. But Thanks, uh, 
So one of the reasons we're here, like right now at this particular time, though, is you actually have some actual art stuff going on, which is kind of cool yeah. because I mean, this seems like the big. I don't know anything about the art world, so you're going to have to basically explain this to me like I'm a fifth <laughs> grader. But so me in the writing world, it's like, well, the you know the big thing is like getting a book published. So I feel mm -hmm. like this is the art equivalent of getting a book published. Correct me if I'm hmm. wrong or, or don't. Just let hmm. you know, spare my feelings. But <laughs> tell, tell us what is going on right now. Yeah, well, I wish I got an advance. I will say that. No, the, the <laughs> art world does not do that. So uh, this is my first uh, kind of splash into our market here in Colorado Springs with the Cruiser Gallery downtown uh, 125 East Boulder Street for, for the local listeners. And uh, it's 12 paintings that I've lived with and journeyed together with. It's kind of funny because they're inanimate objects, but I feel like they are friends. They're, you know, we've, we've suffered together in the early morning hours for several weeks mm -hmm. now, bringing the show to a close. But uh, yeah, so I had this amazing opportunity to share this idea with the world. And the Cruiser Gallery was gracious enough to partner with me to do that. That's great. We are really excited. Can I just say we thank we you, Danielle, to be there, and we really can't wait. We love that's, your art. That's so gracious. Thank you so much. I feel like this is um, the best. Before now, I've done kind of one-off paintings, kind of keeping the the hope alive. <laughs> you know? mm -hmm. um, yeah. When you you guys know well, when you have a growing family, you have little ones. There are some things that just get left behind. And art for me has been one of those things that has had to take a backseat so many times. And it, it always kind of creeps back and finds me often at, at unopportune times, but thankfully it never really went away. And so this is the first time I feel like my youngest child, she's just turned nine. So um, it's the first time that I think I could reasonably engage in an act like this. And it's still been incredibly difficult, but so, so rewarding and so good. That's great. How long have you been working on the 12 pieces in this collection? Yeah, I talked with Abby, the gallery owner, over a year ago. And uh, the paintings have been coming in earnest since the beginning of the year. And okay. uh, I've gotten into kind of a very intense heightened rhythm in the past month. There are a lot of the paintings that have kind of been conceptual or have been not quite there. Um, it's been literally thrilling to see them push through that barrier and actually be done and varnished. <laughs> and there's, there's something so cathartic about varnishing a painting, you know, it's saying, okay, I'm done. Like it's yeah. strange. I've not experienced this before you guys, but I was painting this morning and it was like the painting said no more. I can't hold any more. And in the past, I think I've tried to keep going at that point and it gets overworked and it just gets muddy and nasty but when you're kind of in tune and sync with the work and what you're trying to do and all of the other pieces that are kind of vying for your attention, it's very natural to just be like, you know what? That it's good. Move on. Yeah. So I'm, I'm fascinated by a lot of parts of this, but let's start with the just nuts and bolts logistics of it. So how did yeah. this start? You said you had a conversation with the gallery owner. Did you have an idea yeah. for the theme? in mind or did you have to like pitch your previous work how, how do you right. do this yeah great how question, do you Matt. art <laughs> so, how do you art oh my all right so we're talking about two different things here and i think it's important to delineate one is the actual producing of the work and one is mm -hmm. kind of what i call the business side of art the business of art obviously not mm -hmm. my term i think there's several books published on that but i had a friend who is a friend of the gallery owner. And so the gallery came to her and said, would you like to have a show? And she's this amazing abstract expressionist artist. And it was kind of a bad timing for her. And so she knew that I was kind of moving more into wanting to do more art, creating more. And, and she asked me if I'd be interested. And so I kind of left at the opportunity. I'd been to the Cruiser Gallery before. I loved the art that was there. I thought it was curated really well. I felt like my work would fit well. Um, I'd probably get along with the other artists that are represented there. And so um, my friend connected us and then I kind of went for an interview. And I remember I have a fine art degree and I remember 
one of my professors talking about how important it is to, when you're doing a, um, bringing your work to a gallery to show there, do your homework. You want to look nice, right? So dress up, um, appear professional, have work ready to share. That is a quality is a good representation of what you can do and kind of be ready to negotiate percentages and kind of what you're hoping to get out of this. And also themes don't just come with one theme, but have several kind of prepared and ready to go. So I did that. I I brought several of my paintings. Uh, I think there were three or four that I brought down, showed her kind of what I did, what I was hoping to do. And then uh, I had three themes that were kind of prepared. One, we were about to take a trip to California to kind of the northern coast, Big Sur area. And there, the trees there are, are really cool. We we're going through Yosemite and obviously sequoias. And so I knew I was going to be drawing some of these. And so I was like, OK, I'm going this is one concept. Like imagine paintings and drawings of trees. And then uh, I forget, I had another concept. The, the one that she really liked was this idea of vulnerability. My mom had a brain aneurysm when uh, a month before Sherry and I were were married in uh, April of uh, 2001. And uh, I I think anyone who kind of goes through that is just changed. Like if you have kind of some kind of a trauma like that in a close family member, it shapes you in different ways. And it absolutely Mm -hmm. shaped my, my nuclear family of origin from there. And I think it's also shaped Sherry and I, and it shaped me as an artist. And so I think Abby really picked up on that. And so she was like that, you need to paint that. And uh, ironically, the painting that I had first imagined, I started to, I drew, I liked the drawing, I transferred it onto a board to paint, and it really fell apart as I was looking at the rest of the paintings, because it's thematically, it's all vulnerable little birds. That's kind of the theme uh, Mm -hmm. over the 12 paintings. They're all birds. And there was going to be this one anomaly of this character, Kathy, sitting inside of a bird cage with holding a dead bird in her hand. I'm um, just kind of mm-hmm. swinging there, caged, because she survived, but she lost the ability to speak. And mom was a, a person who was very, very active. She was a spiritual director in our church. She um, was an organist, a pianist. She taught piano, very sanguine, very outgoing. And all that was kind of stripped from her. And now she is yeah. in many ways imprisoned inside of her body without the ability to speak. And yet you would never know it by looking at her. Mm-hmm. So there are kind of several things going on there. My own wrestling with God. God, you're good. And yet this happened. Like, this doesn't seem like a hero story to me. This kind of seems more like a villain. And so kind of wrestling with those themes. And so... um the painting that, that kind of took the place of the woman in the cage is a budgie bird, which has some symbolism of, of my youth. Uh, my grandparents always had these little budgie birds for some reason in their kitchen. I guess they liked them. <laughs> and uh, but there's a, uh, a piece of gold leaf wrapped over the bird's head and another piece that, of gold leaf that's riveted over her beak. And um, as I was meditating on it and explaining it to my kids, because I... Sherry's so gracious, you guys. She has agreed to let me paint in our kitchen. And so the kids, the whole family is like totally engaged in the series and the paintings, which I love. I love that. I do too, Danielle. It's really priceless. And I think if it was in some kind of gallery of my imagination or rather studio in my my imagination, it would become really sterile and it Mm -hmm. wouldn't have heart like it ends up having kind of in the cacophony of a very active house, but about the painting. Yeah. That's kind of what the Kathy in the cage ended up being. And so I'm happy with it. I'm really pleased with the way that that, that painting came together. I feel like it's an accurate representation of that narrative and, uh, and told in a way that the bird cage really didn't capture very well. And that was surprising to me. So I'm interested because, um, you, you, you described this whole process to us at, at one of the guild meetings in the, the theme of vulnerability, the yeah. sort of recurring pattern of the birds. So how did yeah. describe the placement to me? Did you start painting birds and the concept of vulnerability started uh, mm. going through your head? Or mm. were you thinking about vulnerability and, and your mind went to birds? Yeah, great question, Matt. About three years ago, I was really taken with the passage in Philippians, I think it is, where Paul is talking to the church about Jesus 
laying down his divine privileges and taking on uh, vulnerability and dwelling amongst us as a servant and then as a slave dying a death, not eating death, just a death on the crucifixion. And then the Lord, the Father, the Spirit raised him from the dead and seated him in the place of highest authority, right? And so I was really taken with this idea of ultimate authority setting that privilege, the divine rights aside, taking on vulnerability, what does that look like? And so I picture this powerful man stepping down into a small bird and uh, like a little finch, you know, that was kind of what I imagined as being the tiniest bird. And a fun little historical tidbit that I didn't know, but Sherry and I were um, at a photo shoot for Waterbrook down in Jacksonville. We had some time to kill, so we went to an art gallery down there. And they had these 14th century Flemish paintings. And we came around a corner, and there's Mary and Joseph and the baby Jesus. And in the Lord's hand, he's holding this little golden finch. And I was like, oh, my goodness. This painting is like 600 years old, and there's the finch. Mm -hmm. Like, what's the symbol of it? So I Googled it, and it turns out that the golden finch was this uh, medieval symbol for Christ. Interesting. Isn't that? And so I think that has always been cached in my imagination. And wondering, like, what's the narrative here? What's the story? Why that, God? And so it was kind of a natural segue then to just look at birds as a thematic element. And they're, they offer so many cool shapes to work with mm -hmm. as a cubist. Like, they, the feathers are going different ways. And there's another uh, technique called futurism. It's almost like animation oh. frames, right? And so you can take the same object but display it over a few frames. Um, kind of uh, a good example would be like uh, Duchamp's nude descending a staircase. So you see like several yes, yes. frames kind of going down. And um, it was this tremendous wealth and of opportunity to just be creative and play and tell the story. Kind of a sandbox. So it's, well, I mean, even the even the term futurism, I mean, OK, I mean, you got me sold there. Right. So. <laughs> So now, now let's go to the next step. Are these all 12 different species of birds that you have? And how did you pick which birds you were going mm. to represent? Oh, great question. Three of the paintings were inspired by a friend's poem. And she grew up in Virginia. So they're all cardinals, the state bird of Virginia. One of the paintings is of a couple that goes to IAC that is, uh, it's a delightful painting to me because it's almost a caricature where um, uh, Tate has uh, cerebral palsy. And so I found this, but, and his mind is so sharp. He's a published author. He um, writes our sermon notes that are posted mm -hmm. on the website. It's just a brilliant thinker that so many people, I think, just walk right by. That's the one bird that is actually a bald eagle. And uh, it's just a very powerful bird, but it's in a kind of an awkward gesture with these wings, powerful wings that are, are forward facing. And uh, his wife, Kelly, is a hummingbird above him because she's always orbiting, making sure he's taken care of. She's very colorful in her personality and her clothes that she wears and the art that she makes. Just they're a delight. And so the rest of the paintings, and I would include those birds in that, I was looking for gestures, and so I would often go on to Pinterest or different bird books and look for interesting, dynamic, in-flight angles of wings, tail feathers, you know, just how does a bird move in an interesting way? One of them, the most abstract, I would say, of the series, I was driving home one night, and I saw this little sparrow just jot, uh, jet right in front of my car. I thought I actually hit it because it was so fast, then I saw it flying along. And um, it just struck me as the persistence of time. You know, I, my oldest mm -hmm. son is going to be 15 here in a few months where he's always talking about, Deb, when you go teach me how to drive. And in my mind, I'm still picturing him, you know, three talking about rocks. And uh, when he was three, <laughs> it, it, it's just, I'll, I'll stick with that theme of time. But it, there's a certain um, velocity that time goes. And it's so persistent and it's unescapable. And yet you don't perceive it if you're not looking. And it's just like that flitting bird. And so that, that was where that inspiration came from. And then uh, I would often also take canvases to church 
and uh, would be drawing and uh, journaling off and on them. There's a lot of sermon notes in the paintings. <laughs> um, <laughs> and uh, it, I'm it's sure interesting Pastor because, Ken is going to be glad to hear that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Ken inspired several. Justin Weed has one on, uh, I ended up calling it Forgiveness. And uh, it's very intimate. And I think it, that was a transition point for me where it stopped being about other people's stories and it started being about my own story. And I think that's a really important thing for every artist and creative to be aware of. It, there is absolutely a time to tell other people's stories, but to really be filtered through the heart in a creative way is necessary. And you've got to open up that vein at some point and bleed into the work. Yeah. So along those lines, you know, we talk a lot when we're beginning some sort of artistic project, how you start with one idea in mind. And then as you get going, mm -hmm. other themes yeah. sort of pick up. So you obviously started with the theme of vulnerability. I mean, this is what you approach yeah. the gallery owner with, but as mm -hmm. you were going, did any other themes sort of snowball into it? Hmm. Um, you know, it was always, it was always vulnerability, Matt, but the manifestation of it absolutely changed. I did not think I would end up with 12 birds. You know, I thought that there was going to be a Kathy's cage, you know, and there would be some birds and there would be something else, you know, that all kind of work into this idea of vulnerability. And so that was kind of surprising to me. And I listened to this great talk by Elizabeth Gilbert. It was a TED talk about creative pursuits, creativity. And um, she talked about how there used to be these, um, this belief that an artist studio was inhabited by a genius. And uh, ever since hearing her talk about that as a Christian, I love the idea of this Holy Spirit coming, sending ministering spirits, angels into your studio and being attractive as the artist to good ideas. You know, what are they ministering to? What is that? It's not just when we're somber, sad, desperate. What if they're also ministering to us good ideas that want to take shape and tell stories? And so I don't think that we should be surprised when we encounter changes in the way that we are working and where we thought we were going. It suddenly takes a hard left and uh, we need to follow that. We need to listen to that. So I wanted to touch a little bit now on some more of the scheduling things, because mm. I imagine that for a lot of your painting that you do, correct me if I'm wrong here, I'm guessing for a lot of the work <laughs> you, you did sort of prior to this, like, okay, you have this painting, you work on it when you can, and it's done when it's done. But for this now, you have a very specific deadline. My art show opens on this date, and I need to have this right. number of paintings, <clears throat> and they all need to be good. So I'm right. sure that that sort of time clock has got to add this whole other layer to what you're doing. So how, how did you handle oh, that? Yeah, I did not handle it well for a while, Matt. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, I have always resisted and been frustrated by people that say you need to sit down and work every day. You need to show up at the same time at the same day. And I just that's so not sexy. Right. I mean, the artist needs to be this free spirit. Right. They need to be, yes. you know, free to follow the inspiration wherever it leads. And I think that's crap. I really do. After experiencing this, Sherry and I sat down probably six weeks ago now or more. And um, she was like, okay, look, you've got this many paintings to do in this amount of time. I'll make you a deal. If you go to bed at this time, you can have your mornings. And so I've been getting up at ridiculous hours in the morning and it has been phenomenal. And, um, Oh man, more has been done than I ever thought possible. So I would highly, highly encourage all of my other artist friends, writer friends, pursuers of any kind of creative engine or industry to pick a time that works with your family, your partner and show up and trust the process. I think that's the other thing that I've taken away. Come to it humble, grateful, and ready to work. You know, the night before, I'm often thinking, okay, this is what really needs to happen first. And uh, your mind just kind of noodles on that for the rest of the night. And when I woke up, you know, a solution's at hand, and, and it's time to get, get busy. 
Oh, man. So let, let's start with the first. I really <laughs> admire how you can get work done super early in the morning. I have tried. You can attest to this, that's, Danielle. Yes, that's one of your many <laughs> yes, phases. I tried to go yes. to phase like, I'm going to wake up early. I'm going to be one of those guys who gets up, rearing to go, creating art, yeah. and getting to my day. I either yeah. sleep through it or on the days when I wake up in <laughs> time, I sleep during it. So <laughs> I'm a night owl, I found. When I, yeah. when I really need okay. to get stuff done, I'll, I'll stay up late and do that. Which okay. I don't know, Danielle, you can give your... If that bothers you, you can tell all the people on the podcast. <laughs> Now's the, the time. Now's the time. I never asked you beforehand. I think that has been working for us. Oh, thank that you. Has yeah, that has been working. Good. So one thing that That's I'm kind of curious about, Christopher, is you know, as you've been talking, you've mentioned several times as you shared kind of your process and your inspiration that you really draw from uh, the work and the creativity of other artists, not necessarily hmm. other visual artists even. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about what creative community has meant for you, for your own art, and for your own walk with the Lord in the midst of that? Wow. Yeah. Yeah, I'd love to. My thoughts first went to kind of my mentor to Thomas, who is uh, an absolutely phenomenal artist and uh, being in community with him for 12 intense weeks. And then recently kind of getting reconnected with him a little bit. I realized how lonely a creative road can be and how critical it is to be in community. When we create, it has to be a singular kind of endeavor, right? I've never had a good painting that happened as a group. I've had a lot of disastrous paintings happen <laughs> when a lot of artists <laughs> try to work on the same surface. It's just, it turns into mud. And I'm happy to be corrected in this, but I don't see how that works well. But the creating of art is a evidence of a heart that's at a certain posture and a life that's being lived a certain way and a certain gifting. And, um, when we're in community, we can better call that out of one another. And that's what I've seen and experienced being in some of our, our gatherings in the art and faith community at IAC and in Anselm. I've been a part of another art group that was uh, more professional, like commercial artists. And you, as someone figures something out and they share a piece of work, it's an opportunity to humble yourself and celebrate that. It's also an opportunity to be jealous and be like, oh, man, I wish I would have thought of that, <laughs> you know. And I think we have to be really careful and really aware of those tendencies and humble enough to celebrate the wins that other artists have. Right. No, that that makes total sense. And uh, I mean, a few, a few thoughts along those lines, I'll chip in. I think it's really nice. It's nice sort of two sides of this coin. On, on the one hand, it's nice to be around a group of people who, you know, sort of affirms you was like, Oh, we, we know you, mm. you can do this. We've seen yes. your stuff. You, you should, you should keep doing this. So that's incredibly encouraging, especially as you're getting started on something. It's also nice to stop you from going too far in that direction to mm. present something. People be like, ah, oh, I wouldn't do things this way. Or <laughs> I, I, would, I know you think this section's all clever and everything. I would just cut the whole thing out mm. and sort of be, be, sort of submit yourself to people like, okay, I need to be receptive of other people. I can learn from other people. I don't have this all figured out, not by a long shot. Yeah. So it can kind yeah. of help you uh, along both dimensions there. Yeah, yeah. There's a certain level of trust there, right, Matt? And respect mm -hmm. of other people. And that I think that has to be cultivated over time, right? It, has, mm -hmm. it can't just be something that you jump into, but you have to kind of earn that voice, right? Yeah, absolutely. And I was actually thinking how... That whole theme of vulnerability fits into, you know, the, the art I've been doing and that, you know, mm. you, you've been doing some of the other folks in the, the guild have been doing because I have found. And maybe you're, I'd actually like your experience as a visual artist, because I have found that with with my writing, so much of it is so intensely personal, where I have been working on this manuscript for a very, very long time. 
I just recently shared it with Danielle like two weeks ago. You're welcome. <laughs> oh, <Steve>. wow. <laughs> but it's, like, it's like, I need to be by myself. But yeah. then for the art skill, like I'll read the opening, you know, a few pages of it and I feel so vulnerable. Mm. It, 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 it affects me in different ways, but I, I'd like your take on it first. Like, how does it feel having this painting that you do that you spend so much time on, you spend so much thought on, and then you're like showing it to a just group of people? Yeah. A couple thoughts. As a commercial artist, I'm used to rejection. And so I, I think that I've kind of been anesthetized a little bit to that. Um, it's a useful skill but, to have. But, you know, they're, my boss at Waterbrook has often encouraged me, invited me to paint for a book cover backgrounds and different things. And I am so not going to do that. And I've told them as much. It just it is not the place to do that. And uh, I think it's probably anchored in some of what you're alluding to, Matt, of this kind of fear of rejection, because this is, it's one thing to kind of take an image, Photoshop it and present it, you know, put some typography on it and bring it to the table. It's another thing to work for three weeks on a concept, research, draw, finesse, paint and bring it to the table as Mm -hmm. you know, past generations did as commercial artists, more power to them. I don't know how they did that, but, uh, I think these paintings are meant to be shared. If I were to paint them and then lock them up somewhere or just hang them on my walls, my whole world just gets a little bit dim. And uh, I would much rather be in the arena and be misunderstood than never have the courage to, to venture forth into that space. And, you know, they may be roundly critiqued and rejected and, if I can just be totally vulnerable, I think people, mm-hmm. if they see something that they recognize, like a head of a bird or a wingtip or, or something that helps them anchor into a piece of art, they're much more willing to give it the time of day. If mm-hmm. there's nothing that they can kind of cling on to and be welcomed into the piece and say, hey, there's a story here worth your time. It's going to take a moment for you to get there, but I'm going to work you know, this is worth it. And then maybe that painting doesn't need to be shown if the artist hasn't taken the time to kind of think about the audience enough to be like, what is going to be the draw? What is going to welcome them up into this narrative that's worth telling? So yeah. all that to say, there's not an easy way to be a public facing creative. Part of the risk is inherent in the gift. Yeah, and it, it seems like you're going to enter this like phase of even even more exposure now before you've gone from the phase where you're you're sharing it to like, you know, group of, you know, friends, people you trust, people who you know have mm-hmm. your best interest in mind, and now you're showing it to <laughs> the public right. at large. Right. They, they have no... One thing I know about the public, they're crazy. The public's <laughs> insane. <laughs> right, right. Well, there's no blowback if you have a negative comment. Maybe they had a bad day. You know, and that's all part of it. I think I, this thought hit me a little while ago of love, a work of art is an act of love for your audience. And if you're not approaching it with that, that posture, if, if you have another agenda beyond just wanting to genuinely invite and welcome them into your work, I, I think you need to check your heart and really mm. look seriously about why you're doing what you're doing. And that, no, that cover, I, I, love I, covers I, over a multitude of sins, right? So then if, yeah. if there is that, that weirdo that doesn't, you know, <laughs> is tactless <laughs> or whatever, then you can let it go by. Yeah. No, I think that's a really good point. You, you just saying that made me think of sometimes with the things I write, the, the things that end up getting cut or that people think doesn't work. And a lot of it has a theme where that stuff is stuff that I, I basically wrote for myself. Like, oh, I'll show off some of my cleverness, or this is an in joke oh, for me. Right? It's like, oh, oh, yeah. Is oh, it that's trying to so edify the easy readers, to or do. is it me just? Yeah. Oh, it's so easy. So easy. Yes. Good, yeah. good to have a check in mind. Oh, yeah. it is. And I went through a time recently that was fascinating, and it really confirmed for me that I was on the right path in this 
journey. Uh, we have to be careful, I think, the topics that we decide to dive into because they shape us and they'll expose mm-hmm. parts of us that we really don't want to look at. And uh, Matthew chapter six was that for me. We took a trip to the mm-hmm. south uh, where Sherry and I met in our college, and it was this kind of journey back in time. And it was this opportunity for me to look at what I've done with the first third of my career, right? Have I done enough? Have I become enough? Am I enough? And it was all very outward facing, you know, looking to other people to validate me and what I've become. And the Mm -hmm. first thing Matthew chapter six says is Jesus says, watch out, don't do your good deeds publicly to be admired by others for you'll lose Mm -hmm. your reward from your father in heaven. And uh, it was wonderfully crushing. And it just reshaped (laughs) my whole orientation. And I really needed to get to that place to be able to be vulnerable in these paintings. And more than the paintings, like be a certain man, right? Be a certain kind of husband and father and worker and American and, goodness, Christian. A certain kind of human. Yeah. And just sort of in, in closing now... Because as where we are, by the time this publishes, we will be very fast approaching uh, when the show will be opening. So oh, wonderful! And we are and we are running out of time. So maybe if you could just give, especially for the local listeners, some info on the gallery, how to find it, and how to, how to yes. support it. Yeah, wonderful. So uh, the Cruiser Gallery is at one twenty five East Boulder Street in downtown Colorado Springs. If you're familiar with the Wild Goose Meeting House, it's just right down the street from that. Um, oh, great. The show opens on August the 2nd. It's the first Friday art walk evening downtown. Several galleries will be open and showing things. And uh, yeah, the paintings will be up for the month of August. If you can't make it on the 2nd, there will be another event I'm really excited about on the 21st at 6 p.m at the cruiser gallery again that'll be an artist talk night so the way that the cruiser gallery is organized is they have two artists up in an east gallery and a west gallery and so both of us neil and i will be doing an artist talk that that night excuse me and uh it will be awesome i'm waiting for confirmation on some of the details but it will definitely be worth your time and i we can explore some more of these themes of vulnerability. The show is called Parallels. And so how do small birds parallel our own journeys in in vulnerabilities that we experience? Because everybody has vulnerabilities in your life. And there's a healthy way to mitigate that in an unhealthy way. And so what what we're looking for is the healthy, wholehearted ways of, of entering and engaging in our vulnerabilities. So the paintings will be up for the month of August. And then after that, uh, for our out-of-town listeners, I'll have the complete, all 12 paintings up on my website at coreart, that's spelled K-O-R-R-A-R-T dot com. All right, great. Well, I'm super excited we about this. Can't I, wait. I can't I, wait. I can't wait to go. So, Chris, thank Thanks, you guys. so much. So appreciate really the appreciate support. your time. And as always, let's close with a St. Anselm quotation. Lord, give me what you have made me want. I praise and thank you for the desire that you have inspired. Perfect what you have begun and grant me what you have made me long for. Till next time, everybody.